on Business Incorporated. Zambian Central Bank Governor quits after opposition win. IMF approves almost $600 million loan to Tanzania for COVID-19 pandemic. Zimbabwe and the United Emirates sign pact that may see Victoria Falls gold market. Hello and welcome to Business Incorporated. I'm Chimizi Obi Iwago. There was more of negative sentiment recorded at intraday uh, mark today on the African continent. Nigeria's NGX index shed 0.03%, while South Africa's JSC index was down 0.89%. Egypt's EGX30 took the spotlight at intraday. It added 0.39%, while Kenya's All Share Index shed 0.67% at the close of trade yesterday. Meanwhile, majority of investors in the Middle East displayed positive sentiments at intraday. However, Abu Dhabi and Dubai went sideways while Abu Dhabi gained 0.69%, Dubai financial market was down marginally 0.09%. Elsewhere, both Saudi Arabia and Qatar gained 0.07% and 0.12% each. In Europe, stocks retreated in early trade, reflecting cautious trade in global markets amid nervousness over economic growth and a resurgence in COVID cases. For more... Here is Chelsea Dolany. Hello, Chelsea. Good afternoon. Well, European markets have slid, uh, slid on Wednesday with many indices down more than a percent. Is it all about the Delta variant or there are other factors weighing on investors? Well, Jimmy, it has been a rough day for markets here uh, in Europe. The, the DAX, as you can see behind me, is, is down about 1.3% now. Delta is a major factor here. Uh, investors are continuing to, to grow more and more concerned about the outbreaks we're seeing uh, here in Germany. The, the number of cases uh, have been on the rise in recent weeks, and there is always more and more discussion about what sort of restrictions might need to be in place uh, as we head into the fall. So that is starting to have a big impact on markets. The other thing... I would say that's weighing on uh, on the market here in Frankfurt and, and throughout Europe is the question over central bank stimulus. The central banks, including the ECB here in Frankfurt, the European Central Bank, have poured uh, trillions of, of euros and dollars into markets to help support them. And uh, many investors are worried that they will start to pair some of that back. Uh, the ECB is meeting tomorrow and we will get another update on to how they're thinking about the economic recovery, given the, the rise of Delta, also uh, how they're thinking about the rise in inflation. We saw a report from the IFO Institute here in Germany saying that basically every industry, about 70% of industry in Germany, is facing uh, massive supply chain issues, massive shortages of things like wood and semiconductors, and they are planning to raise prices. So it's a tricky time for policymakers, but investors will be close, closely watching that tomorrow to, to see if we get any signals about when that monetary stimulus will be paired back. Now, one of the world's largest auto shows is taking place in Germany this week. What is on display uh, from major players like Volkswagen and Daimler? So most of the automakers are basically going full speed ahead on the electric vehicles now. This is always a major event here in Europe. It used to be the biggest auto show in the world, drawing about a million visitors every year. It has been scaled down this year due to coronavirus, uh, and but it's still going on. And, and automakers like Volkswagen, Daimler, BMW have been unveiling uh, new electric vehicles in, in, the, in the past couple of days. BMW has even shown uh, a prototype for its high hydrogen SUV. Uh, so these are major advancements in technology from the last time we had this show here in G Germany in 2019. Uh, there, of course, is still a lot of criticism of uh, this auto show. Many climate activists are quick to point out that uh, despite all of the electromobility, all of the electric vehicles on display at this auto show, most of these companies are still making the majority of their money from, uh, from traditional engines, so things like petrol and diesel engines. Engine. So uh, this is being really touted as uh, the future of the industry and, and something that shows uh, just how much 
uh, how far these companies have come towards less polluting vehicles, but the reality is still that this is a, a market that's dependent on fossil fuels. In the meantime, the European Union is planning to issue its first COVID-19 green bond, and that will be next month. Tell us more about how that will work. The European Union has said it wants to be the biggest uh, issuer of green bonds in the world. They aim to issue about 250 uh, billion euros worth of these uh, by 2026, starting next month. These will basically operate like normal government bonds, so they will issue them. And it's basically a loan to the European Union from these investors who buy the bonds. But what's different is that they're specifically to be used for green projects as part of the EU's 800 billion euro uh, sustain, or excuse me, uh, pandemic recovery fund. So this could fund, uh, for example, something like a wind uh, turbine park or uh, electric vehicle charging networks. Um, this is a market that has really exploded in popularity in recent years. There's a lot of demand from investors for any sort of financial asset that's uh, labeled as green. So I would expect that when these bonds hit the market, we would see a lot of demand for them. I thank you very much, Chelsea, for your time this Enjoy the rest of the day. In the meantime, bicycles have joined the lengthy list of products cut up in this summer's supply chain problems. In the UK, cart to cycles firm Hal Foods reported this morning that its bicycle operation has been dragged back in recent weeks by disruption in the global cycling supply chain, with sales sharply lower than last year. Let's hear more from Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, Hal Foods bike business has suffered supply chain disruption. What are the key challenges how Forts is facing here? Well, I think this is the first time we're actually hearing from retailer. Um, Halfords, they were doing uh, particularly well during uh, the pandemic. Lots of people uh, got on their bikes for the first time in a few years. I was also one of them, um, uh, Chimaze. Um, because of the pandemic, because of the lockdown, uh, people were exercising again. So they saw their sales, um, you know, uh, spike uh, last year. But this year, uh, because we are seeing so many supply uh, chain disruptions, they have fallen. So they have reported this morning 22.8% year-on-year uh, plunge in sales. And bosses are saying that they don't see an end to this. And this is kind of going back to what we heard from the Confederation of British Industry earlier this week. There is currently a shortfall of 100,000 HGV drivers here in the UK. Um, this is all down to Brexit, really. I know a lot of ministers um, had been saying it was down to pandemic in the summer when people were self-isolating because they had been in contact with somebody with NHS. But no, now that the rules have changed, clearly this is about um, immigration and the British government are refusing uh, to loosen some of these tightened rules to allow people from the continent to come here again and uh, fill up some of uh, that shortfall. And Halfords, alongside um, lots of the restaurants and the supermarkets, are falling victim to this. Corporate News Morrisons has announced it is in talks with suitors and regulators to begin a takeover auction. How is that playing out so far? Well, gosh, this seems to be a never-ending story. I, when you were away, I was speaking to Winnie. I called this a Netflix series, and we definitely are on uh, season five, potentially the final um, season. Um, Morrison's, they are the fourth uh, largest supermarket. They are in a bidding war, a bidding war uh, between two U.S. private equity firms, one of them being Clayton, Dubilia and Rice. The other is Fortress, um, which is owned by the Japanese uh, firm Soft Bank. Uh, CB&R were the first, CD were the first uh, U.S. private equity firm to put in a bid. I believe it was about $5.5 billion. That surprised everybody, um, and it was uh, swiftly rejected. They came back uh, with a £7 billion, I should say, um, um, offer. And uh, shortly after that, Fortress came with an offer of about £6 billion. This has raised some concern amongst um, MPs here in the U.K. Morrison's is one of the biggest um, employers. I believe they have well
well over 100,000 people that work for them. And um, a lot of people are suggesting that perhaps US private equity funds are interested in uh, supermarkets because of the land. They own a substantial amount of land. So when they do take over, are they going to sell these properties? Are they going to look after workers' rights? Those are some of the issues. It is going to now be overseen in an auction by the takeover panel. However, subsequently, the shareholders will be able to get a final vote. So we have reached season five. Who knows whether or not it will be extended to um, another season. But I think uh, shareholders are pretty happy because they know payday is around the corner. Hopefully it will end on this season now. Anyway, it brings us up to speed with intraday market numbers and, of course, how much are UK investors interested in the US job data report due uh, today? Yes, um, the FTSE is very much in the red. It uh, started in the red um, at early trading, very much in the red um, at intraday. Um, as you were talking with Chelsea there, still so many concerns about uh, the Delta variant of COVID-19. Yes, people are moving again, but obviously we all know coronavirus hasn't uh, gone away. Much closer to home, as I was discussing uh, with Innie this morning, the national insurance tax hike is a major uh, cause for concern uh, for businesses. Businesses have started uh, to speak out, which is why investors um, are worried. And as you said, across the pond um, in the States, I think investors are still pretty shocked about uh, that U.S. jobs data that we received um, last week, Friday, much less than expected. However, the Federal Reserve are going to be giving an update on the economy any time now. And everybody is obviously uh, going to be paying close attention to that. Including us here. And um, hopefully we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of the day, Juliana. Thank you, Jimmy. And in the U.S., futures were flat in early morning trading after the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell more than 200 points as investors reassessed growth outlook following a smooth ride in the market this year. For Tuesday's market close, Mario Bird reports. Stocks fell on Tuesday, with Wall Street indices retreating from last week's record highs with analysts closely watching the labor market as rising COVID-19 infections cloud the outlook. Last week, the S&P 500 index set an all-time high in the NASDAQ composite briefly hitting the intraday record, despite August's jobs data falling far short of market expectations. While payroll showed the economy creating a relatively slim 235,000 new positions, the data stoked speculation that the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee could alter its timetable for scaling back its stimulative bond buying, which was propped up by investor confidence. Wall Street has begun scaling back expectations for growth. Goldman Sachs cut its forecast for fourth quarter growth citing a harder path ahead for consumer spending in the face of rising COVID-19 infections. While the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic fueled by the Delta variant, they are probably in the midst, especially for softness in the leisure, hospitality, bars, and restaurant section. Shortage became a drag on job creation. A lack of available workers have propped business to hike pay adjust hours, and even lose some business. Well, the U.S. Labor Department will release its closely what job openings and labor turnover survey uh, that has been expected uh, later today, uh, perhaps uh, this morning as the market opened. In Asia, uh, markets were mixed in Wednesday's trade as data showed Japan's economy growing faster than earlier estimate. Hong Kong's Hansing index shared 0.5% as of its final hour of trading. Investors monitored shares of China Evergrande Group in Hong Kong, which uh, briefly dropped below its IPO price on Wednesday trade before going up around 4%. Mainland Chinese stocks closely mildly, closed mildly lower, with the Shanghai Composite slipping fractionally and the Shenzhen component shedding 0.101%. Elsewhere, South Korea's Kospi shed 0.77%. While the S&P ESS 200 in Australia declined 0.24%, in Japan, the Nikkei 225 rose 0.89%, closed at 30,181.21, while the Topics Index gained 0.79%.
And when we come back after the break, we look at some of the opportunities and challenges COVID-19 has presented for African brands, plus other stories on the African continent. So stay with us. There is no doubt that COVID, despite its devastating impact on lives and livelihoods, has presented opportunities for African brands to challenge non-African brands. A recent survey of Africa's top 100 brands in 2021 released by Brand Africa shows that after a steady decline, African brands have stood their ground on the survey of the most admired brands in Africa. However, the survey showed that brands from Europe and North America continue to dominate demand in Africa. Why is this and what can be done to change this narrative? Priscilla Bonsu, a Wall Street lawyer whose focus is on African businesses, joins us now to talk more about this. Hi, Priscilla. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Hello there. Thank you so much for having me. So tell me, in what ways would you say the COVID-19 has affected the conscience of the people of Africa and what impact has the pandemic had on African and foreign brands on the continent? Well, as you stated earlier, foreign brands do continue to dominate the brand rankings in Africa. Uh, when the brands are broken down by origin, it becomes quite apparent uh, that Europe leads the way again with 41%. North America comes in second at 30%. Asia is third at 16%. And Africa retains its 13% share of the market. With regard to Africa's most admired brands, it is Nike uh, that retains its number one spot, while Samsung is number three and Coca-Cola comes in fourth. The Ethiopian Airlines, however, uh, which were one of the very first airlines to resume services and to actually convert uh, their passenger planes into cargo planes, come in at number 51. Uh, and with regard to the list of brands that are perceived by the African people to have been the most helpful to the continent of Africa during this pandemic, uh, it is the World Health Organization unsurprisingly emerging as the number one brand. Uh, governmental agencies, international bodies, NGOs represented about 20% of the brands, while private companies represented approximately uh, 80%. And of those private companies, Companies, it is South Africa's MTN that is the leading brand immediately followed by the Vodafone Group. Now, how have African brands and businesses reacted um, uh, to this new development and what's the current status of the Made in Africa brand? Well, over the past 10 years, only about 20% of the brands that Africans most admire have actually been made in Africa, even though there has been a great shift to local economies and a renewed focus on local brands. Uh, this is further reinforced by the implementation of the AFCFTA. Uh, some African startup companies have been growing rapidly uh, during this pandemic due to ongoing e-commerce and then social media and collaborations with African entertainers or social media influencers. And this helps boost African brands beyond their local and home market and throughout the rest of the African continent. So what does this development mean in particular for uh, the African financial services sector? Well, interestingly, uh, the same rule does not apply to the financial services sector. Uh, in fact, the financial sector was marked by an adaptation to the digital era and acquisitions during the pandemic. And yet the rankings of the brands in the financial sector are dominated by African brands, with Nigeria's GT Bank holding the number one spot, uh, particularly brands from African countries such as uh, South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya make up about 75% of the top 25 brands. Now, with COVID-19 um, limiting the entertainment and shopping options, which brands are highly sought after in the luxury, uh, communications, media, and entertainment space? Well, the media and communication sector continues to reflect uh, a bias towards non-African media, which overall represent more than 75% of the most admired media in Africa. Uh, during the pandemic, digital businesses, uh, such as streaming services, were thriving. 
Uh, Netflix, for example, climbed up to number five in media rankings by doubling its subscriptions. And due to this rise and the rise of National Geographic, uh, which are all accessible through South Africa's DSTV platform, DSTV is now the dominating media brand in Africa. The overall challenge for African companies, I would say, uh, is for one, fragmentation, and two, the lack of investment. And in terms of luxury apparel, uh, many of the luxury brands uh, saw an improvement in the rankings with fashion brand Christian Dior being the top winner by rising 25 slots to number 41. Uh, however, Gucci comes in first and Louis Vuitton is second. Uh, with almost no opportunity to travel during this pandemic, uh, this increased spending on luxury can also be seen in the space of uh, auto manufacturing where brands like Ferrari and Germany's BMW and Mercedes-Benz, they all surged up uh, the brand rankings uh, on the continent of Africa. Now, when we look at the survey of Africa's top 100 brands in 2021, Africa's share, of course, remains a mere 13%. However, the rise in entrepreneurial African brands in the top African brands list, you know, offers a ray of hope and insight into Africa's potential best. So how can the African governments support African brands in order to compete with non-African brands on the continent? Right. Well, as I stated earlier, I think uh, one of the, the two main issues, in, especially like in media, is the fragmentation and the lack of investment. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing that we could do is invest in local markets. Uh, we would have to invest in local brands uh, and anything that would help local um, uh, or homegrown brands to get exposure uh, and to reach throughout the whole continent. Um, as I also stated, the uh, AF, uh, AFCTA is still um, being implemented. And I think it's important to have uh, a homegrown market for those brands in order for those brands to evolve, get bigger, more seen, to get more notice, and, and, and just evolve um, beyond uh, their national uh, markets. And so, again, I think probably investments in those uh, brands would probably take priority and would be more uh, important. But that, so that would mainly be the number one way to, to, to help uh, the African brands uh, or the Made in Africa brand. All right. Thank you very much, Priscilla, for your time with us on the program today. Go enjoy the rest of the day. And good morning, by the way. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Priscilla Bunser is a Wall Street a lawyer focusing more on uh, African businesses. All right. In Zambia, the central bank governor, Christova Mvunga, has quit just over a year into the job following opposition leader Hakunde Hishlema's election victory last month. Hishlema has named Francis Chipimo the deputy governor to act in the position Mvunga's August 2020 appointment drew criticism as he was seen to be a close ally of then-President Edgar Lungu. The International Monetary Fund responded at a time by urging central bank independence and credibility. Zambia is seeking a $1.3 billion economic program from the fund, and an independent central bank will be critical in securing the financing. Ichilema also dismissed pre Pretzen Yema, Secretary to the Treasury, replacing him with Felix Nkulukusa. And the International Monetary Fund has approved nearly $600 million in emergency lending for Tanzania's health system and economic recovery efforts as the nation battles the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. The fund's executive board approved a total of $567 billion in funds $189 million under the Rapid Credit Facility and $378 million under the Rapid Financing Instrument. The resources will help pay for the nation's urgent balance of payment needs stemming from the virus. The COVID-19 outbreak has led to the collapse of the tourism sector and amplified the need for significant financing. The IMF said that the funds should also help spur support for the nation from other development partners. Tanzania plans to borrow almost 10.8 trillion shillings. That's about $4.7 billion, about half of which the authorities seek to raise from external sources.
Armored Dubai Gold and Commodities Exchange and Zimbabwe's Victoria Force uh, Stock Exchange has signed a memorandum of understanding that may lead to the establishment of a gold market in the African country. Zimbabwe wants to open the exchange in a bid to create a reference market that will see miners offered competitive prices. More than $1.5 billion of gold is smuggled out of Zimbabwe every year, much of it to Dubai. An exchange could make it easier to sell the metal legally and locally. The government says other commodities may also be traded on the exchange should it be established. Change in Zimbabwe, the exchanges said. Zimbabwe is the second Africa country to seek an alliance with the Dubai Gold and Commodities Exchange. And that's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimizi Obi Wawu.